I want to talk about one narrative, which is the role of financial engineering and securitization, because that clearly figured prominently uh, in this particular crisis. And so I want to explain it in a way that anybody can understand. And I know we have a number of securitization experts in the audience, including our two speakers for the second half. But I'd like to reach everybody here to make sure that nobody has any doubt about exactly what happened. And in order to do that, I'm going to use a very simple example that, again, those of you who've taken classes with me before, you will have seen. I want to start with a very simple example of this green piece of paper, which is an IOU for $1,000. It's a piece of paper that pays $1,000 at some future date to whoever holds this piece of paper. So you could think of it as a bond or any kind of a fixed income obligation. Now, it doesn't pay $1,000 for sure. There's some risk involved. And let's suppose that it pays $1,000 with 90% and uh, nothing with 10%. So it's got a 10% default rate. It's a risky bond. How much would you pay for this piece of paper, assuming that interest rates are near zero and this matures in the next few days? It's fairly, fairly short horizon. Okay, How much would you pay for this today? Anybody? What? Mikhail? Or uh, Sam? Uh, just under 900. Just under 900. How did you get 900? The expected value of the, that dollar IOU is 900. Exactly. The expected value is 900. And in order to do the deal, you need a little bit of a sweetener. So what do you think? Eight, 890? Would you buy it for 890? How about anybody want to buy for 890? Show of hands. How many people? 891? 92? 93? 95? 899? 900? All right, sold for 900 to Guido. That's how we price it, 900. Now, that's not a particularly attractive bond in one sense because it's got a high default rate, but at 900, it's actually a pretty fair bet. And we see that there are people here that would pay that price. So this is the first point about the financial crisis and so-called toxic assets. This might not be a very attractive bond, but at some price, it becomes beautiful. At 900, it's fairly priced. At 800, this is a very exciting asset, right? So there's no such thing as bad bonds. There's just bad prices. Now, this is not particularly attractive at 900 for most of you. But what if I made it more attractive? How would I do that? Well, what if I gave you two of these bonds instead of one? Now you might say, well, wait a minute. Why do I want two if I don't even want one? That's like the old joke about the two ladies in the Catskills at a very mediocre resort. And one lady says to the other, the food here is really mediocre. It's you know, horrible. And the other lady says, yes, I know, in such small portions. Why would you want more of this if you don't want it at 900? And the answer is portfolio theory. Imagine if I took these two bonds and I created a portfolio around them. Now, what does that mean other than drawing a red line around it? Well, it means that I'm now going to create a legal entity that will own these two bonds. Let's call it, I don't know, how about a special purpose vehicle. The special purpose vehicle will own these two bonds, and then I'm going to issue two new obligations on these bonds. And in doing so, I'm going to do something that most people say is not possible when it comes to uh, marriage and, and uh, having children. I was talking to somebody about this. Uh, we were sitting in a coffee shop. He was looking at people walking by. And he says, you know, have you ever noticed that it, it's, it, it's impossible for the children of two ugly parents to be attractive? And I don't know where he got that from, but uh, he claims that there's some genetic basis for it. What I'm going to show you is a counterexample to that. I'm going to show you that we can create two children of these two relatively ugly parents where one of the children is incredibly beautiful, supermodel, and the other is kind of a deformed quasimodo of a bond, OK? So these are the two bonds that are the children of this special purpose vehicle. The blue bond is also a $1,000 face value, as well as the orange bond. But there's a difference. The difference is that the blue bond has priority. What it means is that. Before anybody else can get paid back, the blue bondholders have to be paid first. And then whatever's left over, if there is anything left over, can be paid to the orange bondholders. So I've just changed the priorities of these two obligations. Okay? And I'm going to call the blue bond the senior tranche, and I'm going to call the orange bond the junior tranche. And 
the only difference between those two bonds is that priority. Now, why does that make any difference? Well, it makes a difference because it changes the risk profile of these two instruments. And in order to understand that, we have to develop the mathematics of this portfolio and figure out what its value is. So let's assume that each of the bonds is statistically independent coin tosses with the probability 90% of paying back and 10% of defaulting. If I make that one assumption, then I know everything there is to know about this special purpose vehicle. I know that it can only take on three possible values. It's either worth 2,000 or 1,000 or nothing. And the probability of each of those uh, cases is 81%, 18%, and 1%. How did I get 81% in the case of the two bonds both paying off? Yeah, we are? The probability of the first one paying off and the probability of the second one paying off. Right. The two events. The two events together, and it's 0 0.9 times 0 0.9. How do I know that I can multiply them? They're independent. That's the key. I've assumed they're independent. So if they're independent coin tosses, I can just multiply the probabilities. And similarly, the probability that both of them default is 10% times 10%. That's 1%. And the probability that's left over, this 18%, is the probability that exactly one of the two green bonds defaults. Okay? So now that I've got this probability distribution, I can value the orange and blue pieces of paper. And when I do that, this is what I get. The blue piece of paper, they come first, which means that they got to be paid $1,000 before the orange pieces of paper get paid. So in the case where there's $2,000 worth of value, both the, orange and green, uh, both the orange and blue bonds get paid. But if there's only $1,000 of value in the SPV, then the blue bond holders get paid, and the orange bond holders are out of luck. It's only when both of the green bonds default that the blue bond holders are out of luck. And what's the likelihood of that? Well, 1%, right? So the blue bonds have a 1% probability of default. And the orange bonds have a much, much higher 19% probability of default. So that's my supermodel and Quasimodo. The supermodel is the blue bonds. They're really safe. 1% default rate. Orange bonds, very risky, 19% default rate. But remember, there's no such thing as bad bonds, just bad prices. What are the prices of these bonds going to be in equilibrium when sharp traders are bidding for them? What do you think? What would you price them at? Yeah, Cal? As before, like, you can just multiply the value with the probabilities. Yep. For the first one, it's going to be 990. Yep. 990. Instead of 1, uh, 8, yeah. Exactly. $990, almost equal to par. That's a very expensive bond, but it should be because it's actually nearly risk-free. Whereas the orange bond, this really scary, risky piece of paper, 810, that's very, very low price relative to the par value, but it's because you got a 19% default rate. Now, how would this change the dynamics of the marketplace? Well, it turns out that by taking these relatively uninteresting, boring, not particularly attractive green bonds and putting them into this special purpose vehicle and creating these two new instruments, we now have two different markets that we can actually tap for raising money. Who would be interested in the blue bonds from your perspective? What kind of institutional investors would like them? Yeah, Sam? Yeah. Pension funds, right. <coughs> Entities that are relatively risk averse, they want to make sure they get paid back. What about the orange bonds? Who would be interested in those crazy things? Mikhail, hedge funds, exactly. So you've taken these green bonds that are not particularly interesting or appealing to anybody, and what you've done is to now create two different products that appeal to two different audiences. Not only do you have information about it, but the rating agencies that are asked to opine on the value of these securities, they have transparency over it. 